60 Minutes Rewind. His name is I Am Pei, and if you happen to be French, what he's doing in Paris these days is downright shocking. Pei is an architect, the Chinese-American architect who's building an addition to that cultural icon in Paris, the Louvre Art Museum. No matter that the president of France said he was the best man in all the world for the job, the French still can't believe that a cultural barbarian, an American, is putting his imprint on the Paris of the picture postcards, the Paris they think only the French can understand. Paris, where the towers aren't just towers, but symbols of French sophistication and style and where the elegant old buildings are the sacred legacy of days when France was the cultural center of the universe. And as I am Pei found, no building is more sacred than the world's most famous art museum, the 800-year-old Louvre. The first reaction is just like my own. You can't touch the Louvre. You just cannot touch it. That's it. Sacrilege. Well, sacrilege. In fact, uh, when I first presented the idea to the French, by that I mean to the uh, uh, historical monument group, I was sure that I would be kicked out of town. <laughs> <laughs> but don't let Pei's gentle smile and dapper Chinese looks fool you. What he had in store for the Louvre Museum was full of American audacity. Just how audacious is it? Well, take a look at it this way. That's the most famous historic promenade in all of Paris. And before long, taking its place along with the monuments of Napoleon and the kings of France, there'll be another monument, the Pyramid of I Am Pei. A pyramid in Paris? A 70-foot high glass pyramid right there in front of the Louvre? If that doesn't shock you, you're just not French. I think it's time, after time, in the Louvre, in the middle, of this famous, of this sacred courtyard. It's a nonsense and a nonsense. Do you think you're being an American? Made it worse, the barbarian? <laughs> I mean, the well, worst I, I of the say uh, that, barbarians, that, uh, right? <laughs> in this case, I think being a Chinese-American architect has not hurt. History, you see, is important to them. Yeah. And, uh, and I hope that I was able to convince them that I I came from a, uh, a country with a long history, and I would not take uh, this problem lightly. The old Chinese ploy, we know. <laughs> <laughs> if the old Chinese ploy helped I am Pei, so did the fact that the Louvre is unbearable unless it's closed, as on the day we were there. When it's open, it's an indoor track for thousands of tourists in running shoes. You know, the three-minute Louvre? One minute at the Mona Lisa, one at the Winged Victory, 60 seconds of Venus de Milo, and that's it. They're through. That's why Pei decided that a glass pyramid was the answer for the new entrance to the old museum. He said a pyramid is a simple, soothing shape and will create a reception area full of sunlight and serenity. Just what people need before tackling a vast museum. And that, Pei said, back at his home in New York, is what architecture is all about. A harmony of structure and spirit, like music. If we could approach the music of Bach, as an example, extremely simple, there's always a theme. And there's a certain repetition, but it not seem like repetition. And uh, endless variety out of a simple theme. And that is the challenge. Same with music, same with architecture. A few years ago, yes. in what must be the greatest nightmare an architect can ever have, the windows started coming out of a building that the I.M. Pei firm had built, the Hancock Building in Boston. Yes, yes. Was it a nightmare? It was. It had to have been humiliating. It was quite humiliating. Humiliating when People sort of look at you, and architects particularly, uh, very, very sympathetic, you know. That's compassion, but that's not what you need at that time. And Pei had lost that most but Chinese treasure, time, his say. pride. 10,000 windows were making a mockery of his legendary perfectionism. But an out-of-court settlement eventually confirmed that Pei was not at fault, that the window manufacturer had made the mistake. 
Still, for pay, it was a long way back. Seven years. <laughs> Seven years of it. And, uh, and during that period, it was a very difficult period for our firm. Why? Uh, that was the period where we built no big office buildings for big American corporations. Did you think your career was over, ruined? No, I was too young to think that. <laughs> too young, and as always with pay, too convinced that all things are possible in America. He was the Mandarin son of a very Mandarin Chinese family who decided in 1935, against his father's wishes, to go to school in the USA. Why? Well, I, I, I went to movies. Uh, I, I used to go to movies every weekend, and most of the movies were American movies, like uh, college movies. Uh, there were a lot of football games and uh, people cheering and, uh, you know, cheerleaders. Oh, for that matter, people like uh, Bing Crosby, uh, Dick Power, Betty Grable. These are the stars of 1930s. You the, mean, you mean I am Pei came to America in search of Betty Grable and cheerleaders? <laughs> no, in search of that lifestyle, which I like. It's a, it's a free and easy type of lifestyle. And at the same time, I assume they learned something in the process. The story will continue after this. Last summer, Pei was one of the honored Americans at the Statue of Liberty celebration, 32 years after he and his wife Eileen decided to become American citizens. They had little choice. China had become communist. Pei could not go back. It was in the polo grounds that I was sworn in with 10,000 others. It was a difficult moment for me. We had tears in our eyes. It was a very happy moment, obviously, but at the same time, it's also somewhat uh, uh, tormenting. And uh, it's sort of like cutting the roots, you know. It's, uh, and that, at that time, I wasn't sure my roots in America was firm enough and deep enough to carry me on. Do you see what I mean? But Pei became not only American, but the kind of architect Jacqueline Kennedy would turn to for one of those peculiarly American memorials the John F. Kennedy Library outside Boston. It's a case study in the way an architect uses steel and mortar and glass to capture an idea. It's been a long time, and it's such a happy day and a beautiful day, and so many people have worked so long to make it happen. She would say, well, you know, the president, if there's anything that I want, I want this building to reflect his person. And that's as simple as that, but it's an enormous charge. On the one hand, the school children that gave nickels and dimes to this project wanted him to be larger than life. But at the same time, I can't imagine that this be an, a memorial like the Lincoln Memorial. I can't imagine that. I cannot imagine a, a huge columns, you know, stone and, and, and uh, Lincoln, uh, three or four times life size, sitting uh, in cast in bronze, that's not Kennedy, you know. For better, for worse, the solution isn't that huge space. We created a huge, huge glass enclosure. You know that one. After you've seen the exhibit, the story of the life of John Kennedy, his family, and so on. Very intense, very interesting, very intense. And then you emerge into this big room. There's nothing there in this room. That was my idea. I didn't want anything there. No bust. Mrs. Kennedy said no bust, no statue. She was absolutely right. No bust, no statue. But then you cannot just make an indifferent space. It could have been for us. anyone. Or first, he was president of the United States. So it's a big American flag. That's done. Now, we still have an empty room. But the emptiness of that room with the big flag is right because every visitor, whoever it may be, after they have seen the exhibit you know, and come out, they don't all have to say he was the greatest man in the world. The individual, the boy and the girl, or the man and the woman, can make up his and her own mind about this man. And the emptiness turned out to be the right solution. Was that a nervous moment for you when you yes. brought it to her to show her the model? 
well, I, I was so convinced of it. I guess probably I didn't expect any other reaction except say, yes, this is right. But I have to say that she accepted it right away because it, it, it somehow seemed to fit in with her vision, of her idea of what John F. Kennedy uh, was. And that's what Pei's colleagues say he does best, the dreaming, not the drawing. He thinks about a project for months, walks the land, absorbs the mood, and then tells his colleagues what he has in mind, and they begin to draw. Are you offended by a lot of the building you see in America, the buildings being torn down, the ones being put up? I'm, uh, I cannot be offended by that, obviously not, because I, I built some of them. <laughs> but I am unhappy about the fact that uh, our society seemed to be much more inclined to build something for a short time and then tear them down. I think this self-disposable society of ours is not conducive to doing good architecture. And this I am unhappy about. Why is Paris so beautiful? Because the buildings were well built. They were built to last. That's the difference. And we don't. And this I regret.